to begin with, let me just say that uh, Dr. George Venney is the uh, executive director of the National uh, Cave and Karst Research Institute uh, located in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Um, he is also the current president of the uh, International Union of Speleology, which is sponsoring a program this year uh, entitled, this is the International Year of Caves and Karst. This program is actually um, part of that uh, kind of consortium of uh, programs and programming. And so we're super, super happy to be able to be, to participate in that international program um, that they're putting on. Uh, George is, um, he's produced hundreds of articles, uh, books. Uh, he's done research all over the world on caves and karst. And, uh, and tonight's program is going to be an introduction to karst and the karst aquifers of the Bear County area. So, um, but I also have to say that George is a friend of mine and has been so for over 40 years. Um, he is just uh, one of the best people I've ever known. Super excited that he's here uh, with us this evening. So please do mute yourselves and ask any questions or make any comments in the chat using the chat function. And, uh, and George, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks a lot, Gary. Uh, let me hit the share screen, get that going. Okay, and you should be able to see that. If you can't, then someone do speak up and let me know. I see it, George. Great, thank you. And let me change to, there's the pointer option. So um, thank you, thank you for, uh, for this opportunity to speak to you. Um, for many years when I was in San Antonio, I uh, gave the annual geology classes for the Master Naturalists. And since moving away, I obviously haven't done that. I'm now in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Uh, this, this presentation is gonna be a bit different. It's an introduction, as Gary said, to the Karst Aquifers of the Bear County area. A lot of information I'm gonna cram in here. So I'll be going through quickly. I don't have the time to go into any depth uh, of detail in this, but I'm hoping to give you a, just a good general sense of what Karst is, why, why it's important to the area, and, um, uh, and the variety uh, that you have distributed throughout Bear County. So let's start, what is Karst? Uh, it's a terrain, a type of landscape, much like mountains and beaches are types of landscape. The difference with Karst is that it's formed primarily by dissolving away of the bedrock. And so the rocks that it usually involves are limestone, uh, dolomite, marble in some cases. And then in arid climates, you'll have gypsum and halite, which is rock salt. Um, you know, and so, uh, so you'll see this in arid climates. Typical features are caves, sinkholes, underground streams, and the world's largest springs occur in Karst. Uh, this photo here is from an area in China uh, spectacular, topographically spectacular karst. The karst we have in Central Texas is topographically very subdued. These mountains you see in the background were not pushed up. The whole landscape was pushed up as a block, but then all the incision you see is by the rock literally dissolving downward uh, to, uh, to leave these peaks behind. Uh, some of the typical features, as I said, are caves. This is a collapsed section of cave. The water flows and then sinks into a massive cave entrance below where I took this photo. Uh, so this is, like I say, a very dramatic form of karst. Uh, Central Texas is less, uh, is less dramatic. So karst is distributed around the world. Uh, the blue areas show the karst areas. These are only what we call the carbonate karst areas. Um, let me admit someone there, okay. Um, these are the carbonate karst, the limestones, the dolomites, the, uh, the marbles. Uh, it doesn't show the evaporites very well. This is a map project I worked with with a group out of Germany a few years ago. Um, and this only shows what's exposed at the surface. It doesn't show the karst that's buried below the surface, but is still accessible for wells that may still collapse under your feet to form sinkholes. And so there's challenges and benefits that occur in karst, in karst uh, everywhere. Just briefly, the National Cave and Karst Research Institute we were created by Congress. Uh, you can read the mandates here, but essentially our mandates are to con conduct, support, facilitate cave and karst research, public education, 
uh, better management, archiving of data and collaborations that supports all these things nationally and to some level internationally as well. So how do car stock first form? Um, the basic way is that fractures collect water and move water down to the subsurface. Rainwater is naturally acidic. It picks up carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It also picks up carbon dioxide in the soil uh, from, uh, uh, from plant respiration processes. And so that makes the water slightly acidic. And, um, and so what will happen is because the water is slightly acidic over time, it will dissolve open some of these fractures to form conduits. As conduits form, um, they are more efficient for water, for water uh, transport. So water will be, trans, uh, will be pirated away from some of these other fractures into the conduit. It's simply more efficient. Water can move a lot more easily through this large opening as opposed to fighting its way down some crack. Um, so with added water, uh, the process self accelerates. These fractures become larger. They then capture uh, more water to make them into larger conduits and larger still. And then when they become large enough for a person to enter, we call the conduits caves. So conduits are simply caves that are not humanly enterable. Um, and what's the threshold? The threshold for a conduit is something about the size of your pinky finger, about 10 millimeters in diameter, because a hole that's that size, and think about you know, the tap at your kitchen sink, which is a little bit larger. Many of us have seen rusty or muddy water coming out of holes, uh, you know, you know, spigots that size. And so those features are not filtering water. Hydrologically, they function the same way as a cave that we can walk crawl or swim through. So how do karst aquifers work? Uh, again, in principle, we're looking at, we start with precipitation coming on down, uh, getting onto the surface, and then it enters the subsurface in various ways. The bluish grayish rock is the, is the karstic rock. Uh, water primarily form flows vertically down to the water table shown by the blue dotted line. Um, above the water table is what we call the Vados zone. Uh, below the water table is the phreatic zone. Um, all cracks, crevices, pore spaces, caves below the water table are filled with water. Uh, above the water table, you can have water filling some spots, some cracks, crevices, and caves, but not totally. You'll still have uh, air space down below them. So some water will move through the cracks. Some will move through the matrix of the rock itself. Um, some will flow down into sinkholes. Um, some will, uh, some sinkholes may actually collapse where there's a cave and the roof collapses in. Uh, the slow drip water will create stalactite stalagmites. Um, and it flows its way down to the water table. Once it, it reaches the water table, then the water will flow mostly horizontally out to a spring at some major valley or a lake river down to the ocean whatever that, that local base level happens to be. Now, in some cases, and what we have in San Antonio in the Bear County area, is that some water will actually work its way down deeper still and then get trapped below a confining unit and then rise under usually some fractures and faults and then rise trying to reach that water table uh, to create an artesian spring. Artesian simply means that the water is under pressure. Um, so when people say artesian pressure, they're actually being redundant, but it's rising up trying to reach that level. These aquifers are very dynamic and very, in many ways, and complex three-dimensionally. So we can have passages up here, for example, that formed a long time ago when the valley was down, was at this level, but now the valley's cut down. And so this passage is hydrologically abandoned and water flows through here. Uh, as the valley continues to cut down, then this may eventually become a gravity drain spring as well. Uh, this shows you some hints of the complexity. So when some people ask me, how old is the water in Karst? Is it days old, minutes old, uh, years, thousands of years? Well, the answer is yes, it's all the above. It just depends what part of the system you're actually sampling. And so the chemistry, the age of the water will vary considerably depending on what part of the aquifer you're actually sampling and studying. So. Let's look at the, uh, at the aquifers of the Bear County region. 
and certainly everyone recognizes Bear County here. And what I'm going to do here is just show you uh, an overview of what I'm going to cover in a little bit more detail later. The base map here, if you're not familiar with it, is from the Geologic Atlas of Texas from the Bureau of Economic Geology. Uh, definitely go and get it. You can get it online as well. If you have something like ArcGIS, you can plug it in there too. Um, so all the colors represent different rock types or in certain areas, different sediment types shown mostly in yellow and orange. So this uh, steel gray that we see here is where the Edwards limestone is, uh, is exposed in the Balcones fault zone. And it's quite timely that I just admitted Gary Schindel, who's the chief technical officer for the software authority to the McCall, another good friend of mine. Um, so this is where the water enters the Edwards, uh, the Edwards aquifer, the fault zone aquifer. And I, and I specify fault zone aquifer because there's a couple of different Edwards aquifers. But uh, we'll start off talking about the Edwards, then we'll talk about the Austin Chalk Aquifer located to the south of us. Um, us. I still think of San Antonio as home, even though I live in New Mexico. Um, then we have the Edwards Trinity Plateau Aquifer up on the Edwards Plateau. Below that, at a lower elevation and stratigraphically below, we have the lower Glen Rose Aquifer that's exposed primarily in the uh, uh, Guadalupe River Basin, the Cibolo Basin. We do see it up in Blanco County a little bit, uh, a little bit in Hayes County and along the Medina River, but I'm just going to focus on these two parts here along the Cibolo and the Guadalupe. And then we have what I'm calling the, the Upper Glen Rose Aquifer. Now, most of this green area that you're seeing here is Upper Glen Rose, but because this is focusing on the karst, the Upper Glen Rose is cavernous and highly karstic in parts of Northern Bear County, a little bit of Medina and a little bit of Comal, not really in Kendall. Um, so, uh, uh, so anyway, that's why I'm just focusing on this little bit of the upper Glen Rose, but it is regionally far more extensive. So, uh, oops, I almost forgot. Uh, this little skinny line here is also the Cow Creek Aquifer. Um, it's a little skinny line because it's only exposed at the surface right here along the Guadalupe River, but it's more extensive than what's uh, than what it's shown in outcrop. So looking at the, a regional hydrologic cross section, uh, cutting basically from Northwest to Southeast, working from the top down, uh, up on the Edwards Plateau, we have the Edwards Trinity Aquifer and it's called the Edwards Trinity because in orange here, you have the Edwards limestone and below it, you have the Trinity. Now, I really hate the term the Trinity Aquifer because the Trinity Aquifer really refers to a group of aquifers. And the upper Trinity is the upper member of the Glen Rose. Um, and most of it is non-karstic. Um, most, uh, most of the upper Glen Rose is, is poorly permeable. And in fact, as a result, um, when water moves down through the Edwards and that meets the Glen Rose, it pours out of these springs along the Guadalupe and other rivers and supports the base flow of those major streams that then flow down uh, to the south and to the east uh, and southeast uh, across the Edwards Plateau and through the hill country. Further down though, we have uh, the Middle Trinity Aquifer, which is composed primarily of the lower Glen Rose. And I added a dark band in here, the dark blue band here. It doesn't perfectly fit. There's not really a little blue gap there, uh, but, uh, but I was overlaying this, adapting it with another map. Uh, but the lower member of the, uh, of the Glen Rose is highly cavernous. Um, then we have underneath that, we have another unit, which is sometimes a shale, sometimes a sandstone. Um, uh, where it's a sandstone, it's a Hensel. Um, and then below that in brown, again, just roughly drawn is the Cow Creek. Um, and so these comprise the middle Trinity Aquifer. And below this, you have the Sligo and the Huston formations, which don't, which are not exposed and rarely used as water supplies, uh, but those comprise the lower Trinity. I prefer to think of them as the upper Glen Rose Aquifer, the lower Glen Rose, and the Cow Creek Aquifers, just because hydrologically their characteristics are so different uh, and they often function independently, even though all of these things, these interconnect at certain levels. Now, when you come over to the Balcones Fault Zone, uh, faults are where you have some shifts in the rock. And so 
the Trinity, the Edwards Isle limestone that was up here, colored in orange, is now shoved down downward, and it's colored here in blue and light blue. And this is the recharge zone for the Edwards Aquifer, the fault zone aquifer. And then down here, the brown is the upper Glen Rose, much as we saw the brown over there. And then, you know, the lower Glen Rose and the Cow Creek down below there. Faulting continues to shove the Edwards limestone further down underground here. So now here is downtown San Antonio. Loop 1604 is somewhere right along in this area. Uh, and then the Austin Chalk Aquifer is overlays, it overlays the Edwards Aquifer down in this location. So if we look at the big picture uh, of, the, uh, of the Edwards Aquifer itself, we divide the area into three areas. The drainage area or contributing zone, um, uh, which is in orange, this is where water flows down along these streams that are fed by these springs I mentioned along the Edwards Glen Rose contact. Uh, and then water flows down across the recharge zone, which is where the Edwards limestone is exposed within the Balcones fault zone. The artesian zone is in yellow uh, down here. This is where the Edwards is now down below. Uh, uh, it's covered by the Austin chalk and other formations, and it's the confined part of the aquifer. You do have something called the contributing zone that we really won't get into. It occurs basically along the boundary between the artesian and uh, recharge zone. But again, we don't need to go, go into those details. In general, overall flow, surface flow is north to south, but then once the water gets into the Edwards, it goes from west to east, and then discharges through a variety of springs. The Leona River Springs near, in Uvalde are the highest level springs. Um, the San Antonio and San Pedro Springs in San Antonio are the reason that San Antonio is here because of those springs, much like the reason Uvalde is where it's at. Uh, then we have the Comal Springs in New Braunfels, the San Marcos Springs in San Marcos. Um, and the San Marcos Springs are the lowest springs within the San Antonio segment of the aquifer. The aquifer does continue to the northwest, I'm sorry, to the northeast. Um, and we've got the Barton Springs segment and other spice segments further down. Eventually, in a few million years time, uh, the Barton Springs segment will capture the water and will, be and will become the eventual, the eventual uh, bottom of the aquifer. Uh, I'm waiting for that to happen. I'm planning on hanging around. So uh, anyway, surface conditions. Um, typically, when we look at the Edwards Karst, as opposed to that China shot I showed you with very dramatic surface karst, this is typical. This is a photo of Gary I took a few years ago. He's actually standing on top of a filled cave entrance. Many of the cave entrances, many of the sinkholes that we have in uh, the Bear County area and much of the Texas karst are very small. Um, we get excited if we see a sinkhole that's a meter in diameter. Um, and, uh, uh, but we don't, you know, we just don't see that much. So in some way, uh, we don't see large dramatic features in this area. So uh, here's a cave entrance. This is a cave out on Government Canyon uh, where we've got, if you look at the scale, this is one meter. And so the, the entrance is just barely big enough to squeeze through. Uh, and yet you go on down the short ways and then it opens up into something that's fairly large and sizable. It collects water from other directions, uh, creating this subsurface drainage basin, if you want to call it that, uh, and then takes water on down to the aquifer. So as a result, the, many people tend to underestimate the vulnerability of the Edwards because of the small size of sinkholes and entrances that we have. I've dug open some very important hydrologically, biologically important caves in the recharge zone where the sinkholes were the size of a teacup. You know, did you even want to consider something that small a sinkhole, but literally that's how small some of these things were. Now, if we look at these things in the subsurface, um, I'll use an example, Genesis Cave. It's the deepest cave known in Bear County. Um, it's got a very small sinkhole next to it. It's got a, a, a tiny squeeze of an entrance um, you know, there. And so the surface drainage area is not that large. Uh, and yet, if you go into the cave within about 20 minutes of a good rainfall, you'll find that it's capturing water from all sorts of fractures throughout that area and dribbling, dripping water in will create a stream that will take that water and within minutes, put it right into the aquifer. 
uh, if you sample this water in terms of its chemistry, in terms of its contaminants, it's no different than what's on the surface. Effectively, you have no filtration in karst aquifers. So, uh, so when we think about karst, we just can't focus on the big holes here where we can go down and repel into down, down to the water table, but we do need to focus uh, on the fact that conduit size is not a factor in preventing contamination. Uh, if it's a conduit, if it's pinky fingers, pinky finger size or long or larger, the contaminants are going to move quickly and easily down into the Edwards, uh, into karst aquifers. Now, moving on. Again, I can only um, you know have only so much time here. The Austin Chalk Aquifer is this light green here in Western Bear County. Uh, there's 410 right up here. And then we have it here in the Alamo Heights area. And we have some over here that I'm not really counting because uh, 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 John Cooper, a friend of mine had done, did his master's thesis and he found that the upper portion of the Austin chalk is where all the action is happening in terms of cave and karst development. The lower portion has too much clay in it. And so for years we haven't seen much cave development in these areas, but we see a lot down in this area. So I'm going to show you two examples, one from west and one from east, very different type of cave development. So out west, um, what we have here is we have a lot of fractures. It's your typical car system. The water is going quickly down through the Vados zone. It hits the water table, and this is an underground stream that goes on off until it fills with water and no one's dove through there with scuba and it would be fairly tight. Uh, you can see how linear uh, this cave is. That's because the, frac you know, the fractures control much of the cave development uh, in the Austin Chalk in this, in this situation. This is what we call an epigenic cave, meaning it's for it formed by water flowing downward into the aquifer. Now, we also have something called hypogenic caves which is the next slide. Uh, but uh, before, I, before I get to that, let me give you another example. Here's uh, the Austin Chalk along Cibolo Creek. Um, if you know where Green Mountain Road is and where it crosses Cibolo Creek, uh, just park there at the low water crossing and you'll, you may see this hole here. And uh, sometimes it completely fills and jams with debris. Uh, when Cibolo is in flood, a big whirlpool you know, forms above this thing and it takes the water downward uh, into the aquifer, but not so much the Austin aquifer. There's no place for it to, to go to in the Austin aquifer except the Edwards aquifer. We haven't proven a connection, but most likely that's what's happening. Now, if you go to, um, uh, to Incarnate Word and you'll see the, you know, what's called the blue hole there, it's the San Antonio Spring. Uh, this mm -hmm. is looking at it when it's flowing this is a photo when it doesn't flow. And when it doesn't flow, almost Creek, when it's in flood, will back flood and turn and flow down into this and take about 75 square kilometers of highly urbanized North San Antonio runoff and pour it down into the clean portion of the Edwards Aquifer. Um, so we've got recharge through here. This is something that certainly needs more study. Um, and, uh, and if you're interested in doing a cleanup project, there's a lot of trash and junk down here. Don't talk to the university, talk to the convent. The convent is the one that owns a spring. Now, some of you may be familiar with Robert Barron Cave, which is owned by the Texas Cave Management Association. It uh, goes under Nacogdoches Road, which is right over here. Cave Lane cuts right over here. And the HEB at the Oak Park Mall with New Brown Falls over to, to the side here is just down there. This is a hypogenic cave. This is a cave formed by rising water. So the water went into the ground at some distance and then rose up these fractures and then created this maze level, this maze, complicated maze passage. Uh, I believe that this cave was probably the original San Antonio Spring um, and uh, long ago. And then the spring has, you know, with erosion changes in the landscape over the past million years, um, uh, this is now no longer an active spring. The spring is now in its current location uh, along uh, Almas Creek. But again, a very different type of cave development, which is important in terms of understanding how these aquifers work. 
Now, jumping up to the Northwest, up onto the Edwards Trinity, the Plateau Aquifer, um, what we have here is, as I showed earlier, we have the Edwards Limestone, and we have the Glen Rose Formation, the upper member, and that forms the barrier, the bottom barrier for the Edwards. And so now modern water moves and flows on downward and then discharges the springs. We do have from earlier hydrologic periods, uh, these hydrologic relics, these phreatically formed caves. Some are phreatic in some areas, clearly phreatic, but then we have hypogenic caves, which are also phreatic further west, Caverns of Sonora is phreatic. These may be hypogenic. I don't have clear evidence for that, but I do feel strongly that Sonora is. Uh, but these forms these little bubble-like chambers um, the, that occur uh, along the eastern side of the Edwards Plateau. So a very different type of cave development than what I've shown you already. Um, but some parts of the uh, of the Edwards Plateau, for example, in Menard County, uh, near the near the town of Menard. We have Powell's Cave, which is the second longest cave in Texas. Uh, the photo here is not from Powell's Cave. I need to be clear about this. Uh, uh, Gary Schindler took this photo. This is actually an ed, uh, down in the fault zone uh, in a cave called Valdina Farm Sinkhole, but it looks very much like Powell's Cave, and I don't have uh, I don't have a photo of the stream in Powell's Cave. So uh, so we have this long stream here, and then there was a collapse that occurred that caused water to back up this one passage called the, cre the crevice passage and it created a complicated maze here. So anyway, it's a, a, again, a different type of cave development. And so one model does not fit all uh, sizes uh, when it comes to aquifer and karst development. So shifting closer to San Antonio though, I wanna focus on the Glen Rose. This is a complicated geologic map. This is the latest, greatest geologic map. Uh, for the area. The yellow line here is Cibolo Creek. So Bear County's down here, Comal over here, Kendall up over here. Um, and so the, the red pinkish colors, the blue colors are the Edwards limestone. Uh, the green colors that you see here are the uh, upper member of the Glen Rose. The bluish colors are the lower member of the Glen Rose. I'm, over, I'm simplifying. Uh, the black lines you see are faults and everything is getting jumbled up because of faults. So what we see here, this is a cave on Camp Bullis, right about here that takes a whole bunch of water. Um, and I believe it has not been proven yet, it'd be very difficult to prove by dye tracing, but I believe that it comes up back into Cibolo Creek here. And so what we see is that it's actually cutting across some of the meanders uh, in Cibolo Creek, which is a pattern we're gonna repeat such as here in the Upper Glen Rose. This is a cave that Gary and I surveyed many, many years ago called Wiley's Cave. And I believe, and the line is dashed, these lines are dashed because these flow paths are not proven yet, but I believe it formed by water moving across in the subsurface, this meander bend of Cibolo Creek in the upper member of the Glen Rose. Now, again, another unproven flow path hypothesized here is where we've got water lost in Cibolo Creek and coming on down south here into Salado Creek. Um, the reasoning for this is that I was looking at a well log on Camp Stanley um, and we see a cave adapted salamander. And it looks very much like the cave adapted salamanders we have up here. Haven't been able to, sal uh, to sample that salamander to know for sure. That's why you know, it's hypothesized uh, that we've got a flow path here. Uh, and it makes sense in terms of the salamanders that we see actually down in the Edwards limestone. Now, I did some dye tracing though on Camp Bullis from a couple of locations on Lewis Creek and Salado that appeared in a well here. Uh, so we do know that water is moving in that direction. Um, also some hypothetical flow paths. Another cave I visited uh, along Boise Bach Creek shows that it originally probably flowed towards Cibolo Creek, but now it probably flows down toward the Edwards. So again, a lot of complications going on here and then some other flow paths going on down here, down toward the Cibolo. So uh, moving on, if we look further south here, two proven flow paths, one from the upper Glen Rose here in, um, uh, on Camp Bullis, uh, dye tracing done by a friend of mine, uh, Gareth Davies. And then uh, this other flow path here 
from Camp Bullis and areas along 1604 and Blanco Road, uh, work that I did uh, with the uh, Edwards Aquifer Authority uh, before I ended up moving from San Antonio. Um, and so these are all locations within the Edwards that go back to the Edwards, but it's a bit more complicated than that. I'll show you in just a moment. And then we've got a hypothesized flow path here. This is the natural bridge of Natural Bridge Cavern. And I believe the natural bridge is also cutting flow off along a meander um, down along this flow path. And, uh, and while I'm talking about Glenworth, Glen Rose to Edwards, and I'm showing these Edwards locations here, let me show you in the cross section what's really going on. So in gray, we have the upper member, the Glen Rose, dark gray is the lower member. Uh, and then in, uh, in red and blue, we have the Edwards limestone. Well, what we've done is on Camp Bolas and also at Natural Bridge Caverns, we rappelled through the Edwards into the Glen Rose. And when you walk through Natural Bridge, you're mostly walking through the Glen Rose. And we injected dyes and they came out in Edwards Wells. So we've established that water can move and does move from the Edwards, from the Glen Rose into the Edwards. So this is a diagram that shows it from a report uh, that's available through the, through the Absorber Authority. Um, the red, the green, and the one brown line show the dye traces that we've done. And perhaps most significantly are these blue lines. This is a, a, a groundwater model that said, based on the super detailed modeling, detailed knowledge of the geology, groundwater levels in the area, that the water should flow to the east. But instead, it shows that it crosses the faults and it goes pretty much due south, about 90 degrees difference. The point of this is that karst aquifers are incredibly complicated and current groundwater computer models are not up to snuff in terms of, uh, in terms of really predicting flow paths. They're better than they were, but they still have a ways to go. So moving of a back to the north and looking at the lower Glen Rose aquifer, we have epigenic flow, in this case, perch flow. It's perched on the Hensel Formation which in this, in this area along Spring Branch Creek uh, is getting pretty shaly. Um, and so here's one cave called Twinkies Palace Cave and the water flows out into the spring here to discharge. Um, we've, got, uh, low, you know, we've got Honey Creek Cave with about 33 kilometers of map stream passage. This is the longest cave currently known in Texas. And everything you see here is in blue. And that's the average groundwater, the general groundwater flow direction. But we have again some complications of groundwater piracies. And so while that's the main flow direction, water flowing from here and from this area, and I believe this water is recharged from about 12 kilometers away and you know, along Cibolo Creek, it comes up this way, and then the water comes down this passage, and I believe this goes on down and flows into the Edwards Aquifer. Um, so we have some unusual features here called groundwater divides, where water splits up and flows in two different directions here and that way. From here it flows this way and that way. You know, diff go flows different ways. We've got six different groundwater divides, which are highly unusual features. I did my dissertation in the lower Glen Rose and, um, and figured out how these things form. Uh, they essentially have a higher level passage and a lower level passage, water leaks its way down um, and begins to dissolve. It becomes larger and larger, um, captures most of the water, but then some might overflow. And eventually all the water goes down this way. The reason I'm focusing on what might seem like minutia is that this occurs in not just in the aquifers, but in surface conditions. It's not just necessarily between two cave streams, but it could be between a surface stream and a cave stream or a cave stream and a surface stream. And so we see this behavior as we look at how the, the lower Glen Rose aquifer evolved. It's not just creatures that evolve, but aquifers evolve and change over time. So this goes back about a million years ago. And we've got Cibolo Creek down here. We've got the Guadalupe River over here. Uh, the stippled areas that you see are the upper Glen Rose, the area in white are the lower Glen Rose. And so about a million years ago, the lower Glen Rose was just being exposed along Cibolo Creek. And the water had no place to go within the Cibolo Creek watershed. And so it would have flowed out to 
um, uh, to the Guadalupe River to begin forming Honey Creek Cave. As time went on, more of the Sybil became exposed. Uh, water got, was pirated from the Guadalupe River into Honey Creek Cave and then back over to the Guadalupe. Other flow paths developed um, there. As it continued to, to, to evolve further, we still have the flow paths developing. Some of these became cut off. Honey Creek, the surface creek, was cut off, uh, cut off the Honey Creek Cave from going all the way to Guadalupe. And so now the water discharges to the spring. Um, you know, to, to Honey Creek Creek, uh, cave with a name formed around, along this time, uh, Prassel Ranch Cave formed by pirating water along uh, this meander bend of the Guadalupe. And then coming up to modern times, this flow path has abandoned, uh, a new flow path has, a, has occurred, other flow paths have abandoned, have been abandoned. And now the flow path from the Cibolo up to Honey Creek Cave has been pirated back down toward the Edwards Aquifer. So again, very complicated systems. And now here along the Guadalupe River, we have the Cow Creek exposed. Uh, this is one cave, the longest cave in the Cow Creek called Preserve Cave. Uh, it's on um, Guadalupe uh, um, um, you know, State Natural Area uh, on the preserve there, Guadalupe River uh, you know, State Park in their, uh, in their natural area. And so it discharges to a creek here, um, and there's the, the, the map of the cave. It goes, by, goes back about a thousand meters. And it's about, and it's all in the, in, in the Cow Creek, but I believe it's getting its recharge from the Glen Rose, and the water crosses the fall into the Glen Rose. But most of the recharge for the Cow Creek, though, isn't local down here along, uh, along the Guadalupe River. Most of it is recharging through the Hensel sand in the Fredericksburg area. So water moves through the Hensel uh, and then goes into the Cow Creek below it. But then the Hensel, as you move southward, becomes more and more clay rich and eventually turns into a shale once you reach the Balcones fault zone. So I'm doing well on time, but, uh, but still I want to leave time for questions. Groundwater availability. Um, this is a map that was done uh, by the Texas Water Development Board about 20, 21 years ago now. Um, they were looking at groundwater availability for the area. And these are the data points that they looked at. They looked at wells. Uh, that's the information that they have. They didn't use cave data. And you can see that these points, these circles here look very different than our cave maps. For example, Honey Creek Cave, which goes and runs linearly along the county line here, looks very different. And so they developed these maps looking at ground availability and found that, uh, that by the year 2050, we're looking at some severe ground depletion uh, for the area. One of the typical things that happens in karst aquifers is people drill down and they get into a conduit, they get into a cave, and they think that they've hit the mother load. They think they've got all the water in the world. They don't realize that just because they've hit a conduit and that conduit can produce a lot of water, it can only produce as much water in the long run as it's fed by recharge. And so many people over the years have thought about the Edwards Aquifer as kind of like this infinite water supply. Well, it would just recharge and keep, keep pumping. It's not a problem. Um, but there's sustainable use. Just because there's a whole lot of water in storage in the area and the aquifers up here in the Glen Rose have far less storage than the Edwards does, eventually you run out of storage. So, and that's what's happening dramatically in these models here uh, shown in red. And that's what, the, what we have the potential to do if the Edwards, if we did not have the restrictions that we have in place to keep that from happening. So I'm more concerned about these areas. We need to think about sustainable usage. Just because you have a million dollars in the bank doesn't mean that you can spend a million dollars a year. Yeah, it means you need to spend your money sustainably because if you spend more than what you're gonna make, be it money or water, eventually you're gonna run out. So that's one of the big concerns with car stockers. One of the vulnerabilities is groundwater depletion. The other issue is groundwater vulnerability. This is a, a map that was done by Professor Young Lee Gao and one of his students along the Cibolo Creek area. 
uh, and it shows most of this has a very high vulnerability. Um, and some people will say, well, wait a minute, you know, is that really, you know, is it really that vulnerable? Is all that era really super, super vulnerable? Well, let me give you an example um, of, uh, and this is, this is an example I use frequently. Some of you may have seen it before um, because groundwork contamination is a serious issue in cars. Uh, this is an example from Walkerton, Ontario in May of 2020. Uh, there was a groundwork contamination issue here at well seven, E. coli was found uh, at this well. Um, and they knew how they knew what happened, essentially. A farmer spread manure on his fields. Um, the, uh, there was a big rainstorm. The rain pushed the water down into the aquifer. The, the, chl the chlorinator for the well failed and the, chl and the contamination showed up. Well, people were mystified, you know, how'd this happen? Uh, they, they hired a firm um, based, you know, from Waterloo in Canada. It's considered the groundwater mecca. They've got some brilliant hydrogeologists there, but they're not experts in karst. And so they use their groundwater model and create this circle, 720 hour travel time, um, you know, for water to move from here down to that well. Now, why is 720 important? Because within 72 hours, within three days, um, 90, 95% of bacteria will die off, you know, from when it leaves the host organism and, you know, once it enters groundwater. So this is 10 times as long. This is one month, this is 30 days. Everything should have died off by the time it reached that well, but it didn't. They were mystified. Uh, they said this wasn't a karst area, but remember I said conduit size is not a factor in preventing contamination and neither is the absence of caves or sinkholes. These people, again, good people, hydrogeologists, excellent hydrogeologists, but not experienced in karst. They went out there and said, well, there's no caves or sinkholes. This isn't karst, even though it was limestone. So some good friends of mine who are excellent karst hydrogeologists from Canada, they went up there and they put dye into well nine and it got to well seven in only five hours. Then they went to well six and they put some dye in here. Now, according to this, you know, according to, to the model, 720 hours, it should have taken about 1500 hours, about two months for the dye to reach well seven. It got there in only 26 hours. So I've had many people tell me, George, calm down. Okay, we get you a cave guy, you know, but calm down, we get it. And my point is, no, you don't get it. You cannot manage a car aquifer feature by feature the entire recharge zone is vulnerable. And in this case, seven people died. Over 2,300 people became ill, many of which I understand needed new kidneys and liver. I'm not gonna calm down. That's why one of the main reasons we have the International Year of Caves and Karst to teach people this vulnerability. No one did anything wrong in this case, except that they were not educated in Karst. If they understood how vulnerable Karst was, maybe they would have put in a backup chlorinator. Maybe they would have put in backup UV. Maybe they would have put an alarm system in case something went wrong or just an automatic shut off. And so I'm not saying you can't live and work and develop in Karst, but it's much like when I get into my truck, I put in my seatbelt. And because I know I can get killed in my truck, I want that airbag to work. You know, and I want that side bag and the top bag, the bottom bag. I want as much extra protection because again, I could die in my truck. We could die and people have died because of groundwater contamination cars. We don't want this to happen again. And so that's part of the purpose for this international year is to educate people around the world about this vulnerability and prevent tragedies like this from ever happening again. So uh, a couple of closing thoughts. There's a lot of karst around Bear County. Uh, it's mostly to the north and to the east and uh, to the northeast and to the west. Um, and there's a lot of variability. One size doesn't fit all. It needs careful study, careful management, and careful understanding. This photo here is from Natural Bridge Caverns. This cave shouldn't exist. Uh, a past president of the um, Texas, South Texas Geological Society walked through this cave with me and said that this cave cannot exist. He told me that the upper Glen Rose, and here we are in the upper Glen Rose, uh, this is Edwards right up here, but down here we're in the Glen Rose. 
he says the, the, the Glen Rose is impermeable. Um, and he saw a pool, a puddle really in the cave. And he pointed that puddle and said, see, you know, this, it proves that, this proves that the edge was, that the Glen Rose is impermeable. Well, let me take you here when it's flooding, when the water levels are this high and, the, and most of the cave is underwater. Um, we need to understand the complexity of the system rather than try to use overly simplistic models um, to deal with cars. So for more information, um, the Edwards Aquifer Authority for the Edwards Aquifer, you know, if you're interested in the Edwards, that's the place to go. It's got a tremendous amount of information, a lot of publications, go there. If you're interested more broadly in what's happening in Texas and around the area, certainly look at the Texas War Development Board and the Bureau of Economic Geology. The Bureau won't just give you that detailed map, that, uh, that, that big map, uh, Geologic Atlas of Texas, um, but it has also a lot of other excellent uh, groundwater publications. The US Geological Survey has many excellent publications, but especially the super detailed geologic maps for the area. They've got them for Bear County, Comal, uh, Kendall, most of the, much of the fault zone. Um, uh, so that's one you know, source for, for detailed mapping. And some of them you can download as apps onto your, uh, onto your uh, smartphone. So uh, uh, National Cave and Karst Research Institute, here's our website. Uh, it's been down here at the bottom of the page. Um, you can go now, this, this is not good advertising uh, in the sense, because I'm discouraging you from going, going to our website right now, because we're redoing our website. Our website is horribly out of date, uh, but we're redoing it. It's really gonna be fabulous uh, in a couple of months. Uh, so we're, we're getting close. The Karst Information Portal is an open access public, uh, 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 open access library with materials from all around the world uh, on caves and karst. Uh, so just go there and, and search on the term. And then lastly, the International Year of Caves and Karst. Uh, you know, there's the address and I'll just end with this slide and leave it up here for a moment uh, in case you wanna write any of this down. It has a lot of great introductory material about caves and karst, uh, but also if any of you uh, belong to any organizations that may want to be partners in the International Year that may want to conduct any events, you know, post them there. Um, there's partners pages, there's event pages, and, and go to the event page. Look at the announcements. We've got about 90 events coming up. We've got over 30 events uh, that, have, that have been posted, many as lectures that you can log into and learn more about what's happening uh, around the world and le learning more about uh, caves and cars and more are continuing to be posted. And we've got about 160 partners, which a couple more were just added uh, today, uh, including many major organizations um, from uh, uh, the US, you know, uh, US National Park Service, Forest Service and others. Um, we're going to have the opening ceremonies of the International Year at UNESCO headquarters in Paris. That was postponed uh, because of COVID. We still have to do that this year. And potentially we may extend the year into next year because of COVID. So we may make it a two year event to include both virtual and in-person activities. Uh, but, uh, uh, but anyway, that's, uh, that's the presentation. Um, and uh, I know I've, I've run through this very quickly and you're always welcome to contact me if you have questions. Um, it's what I do as my day job, uh, as well as doing it for the international year is trying to teach people more about caves and cars. And uh, we're not trying to keep secrets. We really need folks to understand this stuff. 25% of the country of the US is um, cars or a related terrain called pseudo cars. So we need to know about this. Thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing. And uh... George, I, I want to express our gratitude to you um, as our national leader in caves and karst during this international year of caves and karst. We're, we're so grateful um, that you could show us the complexity and the vulnerability of this system that's right below our feet that I know a lot of us, including myself, take for granted just because we don't see it. Um, I've, I've made the but point thank many you, times. Thank you so much. I've made the point many times to people, I've been swimming in your water supply. 
okay? <laughs> I'm a giant contaminant. I don't taste very good. Um, and I'm not being filtered out. And so if I'm not getting filtered out, what about oils, grease, bacteria, chemicals? Things are much skinnier than I am. So, uh, you know, so just, you know, think about that. <laughs> well, on that note, we do have a couple of questions from our, our chat room, um, specifically on contaminants. Um, Cheryl um, asks, do we have enough protections in place um, to prevent contamination of the Edwards Aquifer? Um, if not, what do you think should be done to improve the protection of the aquifer and, and our drinking water? The, the, and then the, also Donna Taylor asks, what are the biggest contaminant threats? The, uh, okay, yeah, those are combined questions, which, which is fine. Um, we've done a lot over the years to protect the Edwards. Um, when I first uh, uh, started looking at karst aquifers um, uh, with, uh, uh, with Gary Poole uh, many years ago, we were, uh, uh, I mean, people were telling me that, uh, that there was no karst in Texas. Um, uh, so we, we've come a long way to, to understand this. Now, uh, Gary Schindel has actually organized for the Aquifer Authority a series of distinguished lectures on karst. So people are recognizing that it is cursed. Um, what we can do, you know, if, if, I, if I were God and I could just, you know, sweep my hand off, I would pluck out all the homes and all the development over the recharge zone and move it to the south side of Bear County. Um, but realistically, that's not going to happen. Um, you know, it's, it's just that that is the most vulnerable area. You know, we're in a position of following our own nest. Um, so, uh, and we have seen groundwater contamination episodes uh, occur. At the same time, there have been many uh, restrictions put in place that have prevented gross contamination. The aquifer has been contaminated in places. The aquifer as a whole is not contaminated. And there's a difference between the two. You know, there are some wells, uh, for example, there's a, there's a, there's a landfill near uh, uh, Blanco Road and West Avenue um, that most people don't know about surrounded by billion businesses and homes. Uh, and the wells around there uh, are not being used because of contamination from that landfill, even though it's not on the recharge zone. So, what, so those wells are contaminated. Overall, the aquifer is not contaminated. One of the best things we did was in 2001 when we voted for, a, at that time it was Prop 3, uh, to tax ourselves to raise money to buy land. And, uh, and now a lot of land has been purchased. Um, and a lot of it has been west of Bear County. Some of it has been purchased in Bear County. Uh, a lot of it around Government Canyon. Um, but a lot of the land in Bear County and uh, Comal County, uh, Hayes County is just too damn expensive. Um, and so there have been some purchases, uh, but the best, the best plan ideally is to, uh, would be to purchase as, as much of that land as possible and to continue to educate people, uh, which is one of the goals for this, for this year, um, to, uh, uh, to understand the need for more stringent uh, measures. Uh, the time doesn't allow to go into all the details of, uh, of, uh, of what measures uh, can be done. Uh, that's a long, complicated answer. But, uh, but with urbanization, we've got potential risk and actual risk of leaking sewer lines. Um, uh, urban runoff from, from homes, uh, from cars, from vehicles, from leaking underground storage tanks, gasoline, and so forth. Um, years ago, I, I proposed uh, when, if, those of you who, re who remember uh, the PGA uh, activity, uh, and there was a big effort to keep PGA from building on the recharge zone, I suggested that because there was this big push to protect this big swath of land on the recharge zone, that rather than focus on PGA and focus on one battle, that we focus on educating the people and create an aquifer safe campaign, which essentially would recognize businesses as being aquifer safe, meaning that they are not on the recharge zone. When I was in San Antonio, I never shopped, did, conducted any business on the recharge zone. As a geologist, I know where the boundaries are. You know, for example, there's the HEB at Days of All on I-10. The, the recharge zone boundary right, runs right through the vegetable section you know, of, of that HEB. Um, so I don't shop at that HEB. 
I shop at HEB, but not on the recharge zone. Why should I support a business location that threatens my water supply? I'm not against business. I support business that protects my water supply. I'll shop, you know, I'll fill up gas at the Valero, but not the one on the recharge zone. So unfortunately, that never happened. You know, some people were interested, but it never picked up steam. So those are things we can do. Business is following business pressure and trends. And so if right. people are moving to the north and business will follow that, they're trying to make the north side attractive. And it is attractive in many ways, but the south side is gorgeous. You know, why not show that and, and put exert public pressure, you know, that uh, in, in that direction. So anyway, I could talk about this for hours, but, uh, uh, but, but I think I should end it there and see what other questions we have. Okay, um, right. Well, and I was going to say we all know that Austin and San Antonio are, are two of the fastest growing cities in the nation, and the pace of development is is just breathtaking. Um, I really like that idea of of letting businesses be accountable for being um, responsible in their development and being, you know, sort of stewards. Maybe you could call them a the Edwards Aquifer. I think I think that's a great idea. I think a lot of businesses are looking for opportunities like that because the public is demanding it. Um, but let me um, let me get to a couple more questions. We got a lot of thanks and gratitude from people here. Um, somebody did ask if um, if you knew where they could find a history of a cave called Wool's Cave. Wall's Cave, um, yeah, that, that cave is under Canyon Lake now. Um, that's the short of it. It's at the far upper end of Canyon Lake. Uh, and and uh, except during major droughts, it's, uh, it, it's underwater. Um, you know, so uh, it was published in 1963 in Caves of Comal County, Texas, by the Texas Biological Survey, which is long out of print. Um, but, um, but yeah. That's that's the situation there. Okay. Well, we have somebody else um, looking for any uh, book recommendations on Karst. Ah, um, it depends what you're looking for. If you're looking for good general overall texts of what Karst is, how it focuses, or how how it forms, uh, I would recommend Cave Geology by Art Palmer. Uh, just look it up online. Uh, it was published about 12 years ago, I think, um, but uh, it's excellent, excellent book um, and uh, it's still available. There is a book called Karst Hydrogeology and Geomorphology by Derek Ford and Paul Williams. But unless you're really into the nitty gritty details of how Karst offers work, that might be a bit much for you. But Cave Geology is a, is a good one. Um, there's a um, so that that's 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 uh, that's that's one I'd strongly uh, I'd strongly recommend. Um, and what was what was the writer's first name? Uh, Art Palmer. Art Palmer. Okay. Yeah, Art, Arthur N. Palmer. Yeah. Great. Um, we have a question from Patsy uh, wondering what the biggest cave is in Texas. Caves caves are described in three different ways. Uh, length, depth, and size. And so a lot of times when people are saying biggest, um, you know, they may be thinking in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of passage volume. Um, right. And, uh, you know, so let's see, uh, Fern Cave uh, out in uh, Val Verde County has probably the largest passage size, but in terms of total volume, um, Natural Bridge may now be the largest in terms of total volume because of the new sections that were just found. Before that, it was kind of uh, on the edge of maybe being larger in volume than, uh, than Fern Cave. The longest cave is, uh, is Honey Creek Cave that I mentioned. The deepest cave is Sorcerer's Cave, which I had the pleasure of enjoying with, of exploring with Gary Poole many years ago uh, to make, the, make it the deepest cave in Texas. Great, Patsy. I hope you got all of that. There's a few answers for you there, uh, based on the different cave properties. And, and I should point out that uh, that I mean we're talking about Texas. Most caves are on private property, 
and cave locations, cave information is usually kept pretty tightly under seal. Um, right. uh, just, just to protect landowners from trespassers, to keep people from, from going in and you know, killing themselves with improper techniques and so forth. If anybody is really uh, is strongly interested in, uh, in, in caving, I encourage you to join the Bear Grotto. Um, and they just had their meeting last night. Um, uh, it meets on the second and fourth Mondays of each month, normally at Chester's um, on, uh, uh, on 410 uh, and New Braunfels, um, but lately it's been virtual. But, uh, but anyway, I can, if you're interested, you can look them up, you know, Bears in Bear County, uh, Bear Grotto, look them up online or just uh, send me a note and I can, you know, send you the information. You know, I'll do that because my 17 year old nephew went exploring a cave with some buddies of his and he got an earful from me. So it would be good to direct, you know, someone like him to uh, an organization where he could get involved in a safe yeah. way. <laughs> the, the, the most dangerous thing about caving, if you know what you're doing and you follow the rules, is driving to get to the cave. That driving stuff is damn scary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, not to say that you're that you're perfectly safe. Accidents happen anywhere, um, you know, and, and accidents do happen in caves. But uh, but you know, by by joining the grotto, uh, you'll learn uh, not only where the good caves are, but um, but you'll also learn how to do it safely, safely for yourself, those with you, and also for the cave. Right. Right. Um. All right. Oh, somebody just pointed out the Texas Cave Management Association here as well. Yeah. Um, so that that's a good group um, to recommend also. Yeah. Um, I think that might be all unless anyone has any other questions or comments for George. Well, I'd just like to chime in here and say, you know, so and I'll end this here in just a bit. But I just want to thank you, George. Uh, for being with us this evening, and, um, and and thanks to everybody that participated today tonight. Um, I know when we started back in the '70s, exploring caves, we didn't know as much as we needed to, but we knew that we were doing something important, and we always tried to you know bring science to it as we understood it. And, um, and I'm so happy that George has, you know, all these years later has continued to. Uh, do important research and and also to you know uh, communicate that knowledge or that information to to the general public. The science education is such an important and, and responsibility for people that have that knowledge in whatever field it is. And I know George is uh, and this tonight's presentation is in part of that uh, public outreach. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm I'm glad to do it. What, one thing I'll, I'll mention that uh, they ties ties together a couple of things. Um, you know, when I, when I point people to the grottos, you know, if, if people really get involved with caving, a lot of times they form lifelong uh, relationships. And certainly that's how I met, uh, how I met Gary. Um, and, um, and, and it develops some, some really strong personal friendships. The reason I'm talking to you tonight is because of Sorcerer's Cave. Um, I, I told this story to Gary. He, did, he hadn't heard it until he came to visit in Carlsbad. Um, but um, but I was I was in a position where you know my folks wanted me to move away and do some other things whatever and um, uh, and you know and I was tempted you know partly the you know, family pressure and what have you but you know, I was at a family gathering and I just kept having these images of when we made this huge discovery at the bottom of of, of Sorcerer's Cave not only did we break the Texas depth river, we broke it in style. We found a, an underground river in the middle of a desert. And I was there with my two best friends, Gary Poole and Randy Waters. We were running, jumping, screaming, hugging each other. And that image kept coming back to me as I was at this family gathering and people were trying to tempt me away. And it's like, no, that's, that's not my life, you know? And, uh, and so I continued where I am now. So, so in many ways, you know, thank Gary uh, for, um, you know, for keeping me in this. And, and if it wasn't for those close personal bonds, it's one of the reasons I've been involved with caving, with caves for so long. So thanks, Gary. And thank you. And thank you all. Have a great evening and stay safe out there.